Side 12, January 23rd, 2021. After our old director of operations, Ted Bowser was killed. He had been replaced with a new one by the name of Jennifer Wright. A younger and still very cynical but much less insufferable person. As to where she came from and how she got the position, heck if I know. But that's the standard here at the agency. You don't know more than you're supposed to. But after a shift in management, things had been a bit more relaxed lately. But that doesn't mean it was all sunshine and rainbows. Regardless, as a first rank agent and mission supervisor, I was asked to sit in on a meeting between her and our still somewhat new head scientist, Dr. Julian Garth. I wasn't really speaking or actually adding much to the conversation and the discussion itself, but I was more or less insurance in the event of a security issue. After all, we had gotten a lot of new people in these past several years. No, you don't get it. This isn't just cryptids or new weaponry. We're talking about something far bigger, far more groundbreaking. This could be the key to accessing unlimited resources. Who would stand in our way then, when we have infinite agents, guns, and money? We wouldn't need to keep begging the Pentagon for even a single penny anymore. Came Dr. Garth as he held out a folder containing several important looking documents in front of Jennifer. A portal? Really? She inquired in a tone that made it clear she was skeptical of these scientist claims. Not just a portal, a gateway to another world, another earth, potentially one that's just like this. I mean, look at these readings. This is more than just a discovery. This is an investment that can mean we never have to truly spend another dollar ever again. Jennifer grabs the stack of documents, looking them over like a school teacher grading a student's paper. She held a shot expression but it was clear that her skepticism was still present nonetheless. And what if you're wrong? What if this leads to nothing and it's a dead end? She grilled after looking back up at Dr. Garth. It can't hurt to send one or two men through the gateway, can it? Just to see what's on the other side. He fires back. That's something you should already know. You want me to waste agents in the event the other end of this portal opens up into the core of the sun or something. Further research can be done. We still have enough remaining in the budget. But what I need is hope from you and your approval to continue on the project past this point. I can have double this amount of data on your desk within a week. Garth went on, giving Jennifer a look that said he was desperate for her to accept his proposal. But instead of responding immediately, Jennifer stands up and lets out a slow exhale looking straight ahead of me and causing me to perk up. What do you think of this? Are you willing to check out another world? With all due respect, ma'am, with everything we've seen in our decades and decades of being in operation, it can't be nearly as crazy as you're making it out to be. I think it could be worth a shot, but it should definitely be more than two agents and going in at a time. And unlike with Ted, my opinion actually seemed to hold some weight with her. She darted her eyes between Dr. Garth and me, contemplating her next words carefully. Fine, but you will be in charge of making sure the team we send in is properly briefed. You have one week to do thorough testing, and if you don't have an extensive report at my desk in exactly seven days from now, then it's not happening. Dr. Garth flashed me a thankful smile, pleased with my surprisingly persuasive response to her inquiry. And with that, she got up and calmly exited the room, although she had been firm about her terms. She didn't seem angry, just more skeptically curious. But seeing as she was the one in charge, I assumed she didn't want the weight of all the responsibility if things went horribly wrong. Over the next several days, Garth and I did as we were told. We got a four team together including me, Agent Terrence, Agent Melody, and Agent Ward. Dr. Garth went through some testing with the rest of the site's science division and made sure the gateway was properly stable and tested. 
In other worlds, huh? Came Agent Ward as he finished lighting a cigarette, before taking a few small puffs and blowing the smoke into his own face. <laughs> Kinda sounds like a disaster waiting to happen. At least it's something different. Ever since we lost 16A exterminating cryptids, it's been a bit more difficult recently. Agent Melody added. Agent Ward simply snorted, as if trying to hold back audible laughter. Please, you really think we need that freak? Wherever he's off to now, he's probably wishing he still had us to hold his hands, or claws, or whatever the heck he had. Listen, Jennifer said that if it all goes well with this mission, we'll get a huge salary increase. So let's all put our backs into it and make sure that this really ends up being worth it. I interjected, clutching the grips of my assault rifle. No, we ended up discussing for only a few minutes more before Dr. Garth and another scientist poked their head through the door of the briefing room, both of them harboring grins. It's time, he announced, hiding his schoolgirl ass excitement. And we journeyed over to the Block A laboratories before being led into a large, circular room with all sorts of contraptions and technology set up along the walls and ceiling. In all my years with the agency, it's one that I had never seen before. The light inside was dimming on and off repeatedly. The source, probably the tall but thin black void, is sitting just in front of the wall exactly opposite the door. It felt almost magnetic like it was sucking us in. The pulling force wasn't enough to knock anything around but paper and hair, but it was still there. Jennifer was in the room, along with a mission control rep who stared at these several seemingly blank monitors in front of him, before adjusting his glasses as if that would help. And due to the differences in frequencies, the signal of both your visor cameras and radios just won't be able to make it through the gateway, Dr. Garth explained, causing Melody, Terrence, and Ward and I to flash each other concerned looks. You all have exactly two hours to explore what's on the other side. Anyone who doesn't make it back within that time frame will be left behind and the gateway will be closed. We are expending a lot of energy and resources to even keep this thing open in the first place. Jennifer added in. Why were we told this in the briefing? Terrence asked demandingly. Dr. Garth and Jennifer simply ignored his question. And although I myself was also curious as to why we weren't told, I still needed to fill my role. So I slowly marched forward, waving at the rest of the team to follow behind. Were we potentially marching to our own deaths? Sure. But the description fit quite nearly everything we did in this job. But we were ignorant at the time as to what truly horrific nightmare was awaiting us on the other side. Something about the void was almost enchanting in a way, like I was just naturally drawn toward it. This wasn't exactly the kind of internal reaction that I was expecting myself to have, but it happened nonetheless. I got just within a foot away looking back at both Jennifer and Dr. Garth, hoping this was actually as truly worth it as we were hoping. But I couldn't hesitate any longer. I stepped into the portal, preparing myself for what horrific things I may or may not have seen on the other side. It was rather disorienting at first, like the feeling you get going down a water slide for the first time. The euphoria itself didn't last very long, but it was potent in its short-lived existence. And before I even gave myself a chance to get a good look at what was on the other side, I immediately turned back to see if the team had followed me safely through the gate. First, emerged to Terrence, who appeared a bit dizzy and out of it before snapping back to his usual demeanor. Melody was second, looking around in both fascination and worry. And finally came Ward, who seemed rather unimpressed. And out of all three of these reactions, I didn't know which one I agreed with the most. It was more or less a healthy combination of Terrence's and Melody's. I turned back around laying eyes upon what looked to be an alternate version of the room that we were just in, except just much more beaten down and empty looking. And despite it being so simple, so plain on a first glance, it was fascinating. 
the multiverse was real. Oh, now this, this is pretty trippy here. Ward announced, taking a few more glances around to make sure what he was seeing was real. And despite his lack of enthusiasm before her, I think the gravity of the situation was beginning to hit him. That doesn't mean it's safe. We should all keep our guard up, Terrence adds. All in all, he was correct, so we all moved forward, looking around for anything that could have possibly posed a threat. But as we stepped out into the hallway of this alternate Site 12 facility, we realized it wasn't in as good of a shape as ours was. Most of the lights were off and are flickering, giving the interior an eerie vibe, like something straight out of a child's nightmare. Our underbarrel flashlights helped, but only just a bit. I was shocked that they even ended up surviving the trap. We continued moving down the hallway. The silence in the building was deafening, and it was looking like this place would be completely empty with not much else going on until we got to the end of the science wing hall and into the main lobby area. I turned the corner, shining my flashlight at the hall just a few feet ahead, only to be put on edge when I got a glimpse of a long, jagged stain of blood running across the white tiled floor. Blood that didn't look very old at first glance. It's not something we haven't seen before, I said, attempting to hide my admittedly unsettled move from the rest of the team. I was used to things going wrong out in the middle of a neighborhood, a forest or an abandoned factory, but this and a high-level security facility like ours, it just felt wrong. Not that we hadn't ever had breaches before, but whatever happened to this version of Site 12 must have been disastrous, and much more than a simple breach. Guess it's not turning out to be as fun as you had hoped, huh? Ward butted in, getting his own good look at the large bloodstain. We need to find out what happened here, I say, ignoring Ward's comment. It looks like things didn't turn out so well for this version of Site 12. You think? Terrence added sarcastically. We kept an eye on our surroundings, our guards were up, and our senses were running on high alert. Looking for whatever it was that might have been the reason that blood was there in the first place. But unfortunately for us, it wouldn't be long before we got our answer. No, please. We all immediately ran forward while gripping our rifles. The scream of the man had sounded like it was coming from around the corner at the end of the hallway in front of us. The team and I all dashed down it, quick to find the source of the blood-curdling cry for help. Whatever had caused this place to go all post-apocalyptic may have still been on the loose and still finishing up its rampage. Once we rounded the corner, we were only greeted by another hallway, one that was nearly identical to the same one in our universe with only a few small differences, such as pipe and tile placement. But none of that really mattered. What did matter, though, was the still barely alive agent at the end of it. He was fully geared up and dressed, just like us, but lying on his back in a pool of his own blood, with his rifle snapped in half lying next to him. We all rushed over to him, closing the distance in seconds, by the looks of things, it didn't look like he would be able to survive much longer. But at the very least, we would be able to get some info out of him about what had happened here. Although I or the rest of the team didn't recognize him as a doppelganger from our universe specifically, we still engaged him. I leaned down, wiping some blood away that was bubbling up in his mouth and dripping down his chin. What happened to you? I asked attempting to use a somewhat soft tone towards the dying man. What did this? I could tell that he struggled with this answer. He was in no condition to really have a conversation of any kind. He tried to point behind me as if he wanted us to go that way. I turned and looked, only to not see anything of interest, besides several more mangled bodies of deceased agents. But I knew something did this to them and it was still here. And with his choking gas, I couldn't help but let him suffer any longer, so I made the decision that I thought was right at the time. 
Melody, I said, looking up to her and nodding down at the dying agent before he slowly reached up and firmly gripped my arm with his left hand. But she didn't even have to figure out what it was that I wanted. She simply raised her weapon, pointed the barrel at the agent's head, and fired off a round to put him out of his misery. It would have had to have happened either way, but I had always been a strong believer that a quick death was better than suffering. Even if we did have the tools or ability to help him, we weren't allowed to, not with how fatally wounded he was. Once an agent was either mortally wounded or disabled beyond the ability to physically perform their job permanently, they were to be terminated. The higher ups said that it cost a lot more money to keep the useless ones alive than it is to get rid of them altogether. Their words, not mine. Is this really worth it? We should probably have a few more agents here if we're going to be dealing with something like this. Taryn spoke up. One of the Wendigos we kept for experimentation probably got loose. Melody responded. Besides, Jennifer will be pissed if we come back this early on. Before anyone could fire back, we all snapped to attention after hearing a brief but potent scratching noise coming from down the hallway in the direction that the agent had pointed to earlier on. What the heck was that? Terrence grilled, sounding agitated and demanding of an answer. Probably the thing that did this. Melody snapped, not taking her eyes off the hall. We should let it come to us, I suggested. We have the advantage by being alert and ready here. Going down there and turning the corner could mean walking right into a trap. Let's split in two groups of two. One duo goes down the hallway and the other watches their back, said Terrence. The scratching sound emerged again, this time seemingly being a bit closer to us. It sounded like it was coming from the ceiling, but looking up revealed nothing. And part of me thought that I was uh, just losing it, and that this whole alternate universe thing was getting to my head. Oh, what was that right above us? Asked Ward, attempting to maintain a professional tone. It might be something in the vents. Just keep your eyes peeled. If only it were that simple. I was afraid to admit that I was a bit unsettled. No matter how tough and hardened you are, the feeling of being hunted, being watched, and being stalked like prey will always scare you at least a little bit. Yeah, about that splitting up thing... I'm going to have to go ahead and say no on that. It's safety in numbers, I pronounced. We all either have to move together or not at all, but we're not splitting up and asking to get ourselves killed. So we all moved forward as one, the scratching noise briefly popping up here and there above us. We all kept our line of sight locked in different directions just in case whatever it was tried to attack from a certain angle. But despite our best efforts and despite the fact I was comforted by the other agent's presence, I still felt like we were hilariously outgunned by whatever it was that was stalking us. I didn't let the team know that, of course. The last thing they need is their leader freaking out in front of them. Let's try to get somewhere more secure. This is too open and too vulnerable. We're sitting ducks in this hallway. I said in a tone that I dictated I was in no mood for debate. You think this version of the site as the safe room where they found Dr. West's bloodstains in our universe? Terrence inquired. Yeah, they should. Everything's been similar enough so far. If we can make it, we can try and hunger down until we can figure out a way to bait this thing and kill it. Bait me? Came a strange, bass-filled, monstrous, and just barely human-sounding voice from above, causing all of us to immediately turn off and fire our weapons blasting whatever it was full of holes. But apparently it saw this coming, quickly darting across the ceiling and using the cover of the darkness and flickering lights to its advantage. From what milliseconds of glimpses I caught though, it was big as far as height, but thin in width. Part of me had even thought it might have been an arachnid in nature. I hadn't gotten a good enough look to fully conclude. We seized our fire. The logical solution would have been to put on our night vision goggles so we could see what we were fighting much better. But with the main lights flickering at inconsistent rates, we could potentially damage our eyesight. Not to mention they weren't even working to begin with. 
What in the heck was that? Ward cursed. His earlier display of confidence now fully faded away. But instead of being able to answer him myself, the mystery creature spoke up instead, that same commanding voice piercing through the hallway. I am what you wanted me to be all along. A weapon, it responded, this time coming from around the corner. Tough talk for something that hides, Melody shouted, attempting to maintain a sense of dominance in the situation. The only thing I ever hid was my hatred for you, for Dr. John, and every single human in this horrendous organization. The voice fired back, unaware that we weren't native to this version of the agency. However, it didn't take me too long to piece together what, or rather who, this voice belonged to. Someone that had been an important part of our operations years ago but had gone rogue. A creature created by the scientists in our universe, Site-12, for the purpose of helping us hunt down and kill cryptids more efficiently. Subject 16A What did we ever do to you? We fed you, gave you a home, and provided with you all the resources you needed to survive. Sounds to me like you're just ungrateful, I cried out, attempting to agitate this alternate 16A so he would emerge. It was in our best interest to assume that he had similar abilities and strength to the one that we used to know. And if that was actually the case, we'd be more easily able to take him down. And judging by his comment about Dr. John, it appears that he had more than likely been the one to create him in this dimension. Because in our reality, he had fled the agency with him and killed his creator, Dr. West. And we were too out in the open and he could easily grab one of us from the middle of the hallway if he played his cards right. So I turned to the team, whispering about us marching in a formation that could allow us to watch every possible angle as we moved. Ward, Melody, you both watch the back angles. Terrence and I look out for the front ones. We move quickly but quietly. You understood? I said as quietly as can be, keeping my ears open. No, we need to go back. You really think this is worth it? Ward, a whisper shouted. He'll kill us, and this will be all for nothing. This mission ain't worth it. Nothing that we do is worth it. And you're an idiot for agreeing to even do this in the first place. What? You gotta impress your goddess, Jennifer, is that it? Ward, shut your mouth, I snapped. Just about being able to keep my voice at a whisper, despite my irritated state. You know you think you're so smart, but you're going to be the reason that we all end up dead. Ward continued, only angering the rest of us. Ward, shut up. Melody stepped in, spit flying out of her mouth right before she gritted her teeth. I'm going to make a run for her. And just before Ward could get his next word out, he was suddenly grabbed and snatched up towards the ceiling as the lights had flickered screaming and firing his weapon frantically and clumsily before it fell on the floor, causing all of us to come within inches of getting shot. Ward! I screamed as we immediately opened fire at the ceiling. It had all happened so fast. One second he was there and the next he was gone, pulled away like nothing more than a box of cardboard. I could hear his screams of pure terror and dread as what I assumed was 16A crawling along the ceiling with him in hand. I forgot just how fast and agile he was. It was clear that he had moved fast enough to evade our gunfire. Make it far enough away to chasing him would have only meant similar fates for the rest of us. Ward's fate was now out of our hands as the three of us who still remained turned and halted down the opposite end of the hallway as his screams continued to fill in. But only for a few seconds, I could have sworn that I heard the sound of bone snapping followed by a swift plunge back into silence, save for our footsteps and heavy breathing. Melody had led the charge, but I wasn't far behind. Terrence took up the rear, but seeing as he was the biggest of us all, it wasn't surprising. The guy had packed on quite a bit of muscle in the past couple of years. For the time being, I'm not sure if 16A was in pursuit, but let's be honest, if he was, he would have already caught us long ago. In our universe, I had seen him outrun a Wendigo on more than one occasion, 
and those things are known for their speed. And the best thing to do now was to exit the building entirely. One of 16A's that biggest combat advantages was his ability to scale nearly any surface and climb like a freaking spider everywhere. If we take him out of his element, we may have a better chance. Come on, I commanded, knowing full well that it was pointless to be quiet anymore anyway. We turned a corner and made it back into the main area of the building, finding the big double doors of the entrance. I stopped once a few feet away and shot the lock off the doors before having Terrence run and bash his way through them, quickly following him along with Melody without even looking up from the ground. But once I did, I realized that they were both beyond lucky, and potentially even more screwed than before. Outside our universe's facility, it's mainly a long, bare road with some forest behind the building. But this, this wasn't even close. This version of Site 12 was an island, a small but stable looking one surrounded by strange murky water. If this universe had an ocean then this couldn't have been it, unless ocean water here had much more in common with swamp water than seawater. The sun was yellow, the sky was blue and everything else seemed to be similar, everything except for the water. Regardless, we all ran as far away as we could from the building. About a quarter of a mile there was a dock at the end of this side of the island, but with no boats in sight. But if we could at the very least hold out at the end of the dock and keep our guns pointed straight ahead, he wouldn't be able to get to us. But eventually, we did have to make it back to the portal. Not that he knew that. I caught a glimpse of something shiny slightly out of my left shoulder. After moving my eyes slightly in order to get a better idea of what exactly it was, I was able to mentally relax, but only a little bit. The substance was a dark blue, a thick but runny liquid, about six or seven drops worth. But it wasn't long before it clicked in my head as to where it came from. It was blood. Some of 16A's blood. Perhaps we had actually hit or struck him with a bit of gunfire after all. Although judging by how much there was combined with his healing abilities, it couldn't have been fatal nor serious. The rounds that we used were armor piercing and very powerful. Our version of 16A was resistant to low caliber gunfire, according to Dr. West, so I'm sure this doppelganger was no different. You shoot any normal man with the bullets that we use and he'll be turned into mush, but 16A could take a few shots without a crazy amount of pain or injury. I was huffing and puffing at this point in our escape, but running full speed in heavy equipment and tactical gear will do that to you. Luckily, we all just about had the stamina left to make it to the end of the dock. I turned around, looking for any leftover helicopters. I had no pilot or avian certifications, but heck, I didn't care. I'd try flying one regardless in this situation. But of course, luck was not on our side, so we stuck with the dock plan. Melody was the first one to recover and catch her breath after the whole running ordeal, raising her gun towards the facility in a slightly shaking manner. I followed suit next, marrying her stance. Terrence, however, looked really out of it. He struggled to fully recover and was standing close to the edge of the dock as he inhaled and exhaled rapidly. And when I say close, I mean a little too close. So I turned to go help him while Melody kept watching the open field in front of us. I reached down around my mostly empty utility belt and grabbed my leather-wrapped flask filled with water, popping off the cover and reaching out to give it to him as I attempted to nudge him away from the edge. Here, drink this. And that's an order. We need you strong, big guy. I told him firmly as he reached out for it, seemingly grateful for the offer. I never knew why only the leading agent got to have a flask of water on them during operations, but that was the rule that worried me the least in this organization. But just as his fingers gripped the flask, the dock suddenly and violently shook, causing both of us to lose our balance and fall right over the side. We plunged into the water, our rifles and gear coming with us. I heard Melody yell out for both of us and for a moment I thought that would be it that this strange, murky swamp water was filled with 
some alternate universe radiation that would instantly kill us, but no. For the most part, it felt and reacted like water usually did, although it was still incredibly hard to see. I was already six or so feet under the surface when I finally got a hold of myself. I looked down, seeing that Terrence had sunken even further in the nearly brown sea. I swam my way over to him, his lack of energy paradoxically keeping him in a panic state as he kicked his feet and flailed his arms aimlessly. He was always a half-decent swimmer, but the intensity of the situation was overcoming his ability to think rationally. Once I had grabbed a hold of him, I kicked as hard as I could and maneuvered my way through the water, back up towards the surface. Taking another look down as I did, and being met with a mundane horror. I watched as Terrence and I's rifles sank deep into the abyss below, along with the flask of water, never to be seen or retrieved again. It was terrifying, staring down into what seemed like an endless void of an ocean that was potentially even deeper and more monstrous than the one I was familiar with. I was both fascinated and horrified and not many things caused me to feel that so easily. But this wasn't your immediate adrenaline-inducing terror, no. It was deeper, worse, and almost cosmically horrifying. I sat there, looking down on my legs hung above what could have been miles and miles of an abyss below. An abyss that I couldn't even see a mere fraction of. I swam up, quickly snapping myself out of a little episode. I dragged a Terrence with me, both of us breaking the surface and coughing up water before gasping for air. I looked back up at the dock, spotting Melody leaning over the side with a rifle next to her, holding out a hand for the both of us. By this point, I wasn't sure how long she had had her eyes taken off the door, and if 16A had gotten the chance to exit the building and come barreling towards us. I reached out for her hand first. A team effort occurred between the two of us in order to pull me up, as I groaned and strained my arms to do so. My soaking wet gear making it all the more difficult to raise my weight out of the water. Hey, Terrence cried out, causing me to turn my head after I had made it back up onto the dock. I glanced out behind him, squinted my eyes to get a better look at what it was that he was pointing at. It didn't take me long to find it though, and when I did... I knew that we had to get him out of here as quickly as we could. About 200 meters or so out, I spotted a near comically colossal creature swimming in our direction. It had to be 30 feet long bare minimum, and that estimate only came from what I saw above the surface. Speaking of which, it was several feet wide as well, resembling that of a sea slug. An absolutely massive sea slug. Its back was a darker purple with long, pointy spikes that were white at the tips, sticking straight out nearly every few square inches. Water displaced and bubbled up as the creature swam right towards us. It didn't appear to be very fast, but I couldn't tell if that was because it was swimming slowly on purpose or because it didn't think that we had noticed it yet. Part of me wondered how it had known that we were here. Was it the splashing? Probably. But as I reached out to grab Terrence's hand, I realized what actually made more sense. 16A's blood was now gone from my shoulder. This thing had smelled it after it had been dispersed into the water, and now Terrence was in danger because of my clumsy decision making. I wasn't actually sure what normal sea slugs ate. Probably not humans, but considering both the size and unnatural nature of this one, I wasn't going to take the chance. Once the creature was about 150 meters out, it dove under the surface and completely submerged itself. I ordered Melody to look down the scope of her rifle to keep an eye on it, while I began to pull Terrence up. She did, right after checking the building to see if 16A had made his way over, and thank god he hadn't. I hoisted a Terrence up high enough for him to be able to grab a hold of the dock himself, allowing Melody to turn her attention back to the building. Terrence coughed and hacked up a bit of water once he finally laid on the wood of the dock, but that was to be expected. We need to move away from the dock, 
With how big that thing is, it could easily lunge its way up here and grab one of us like we're a snack on the top shelf of the grocery store. I announced, rather frantically, reaching down to my belt and pulling out my sidearm, a 50 caliber Desert Eagle pistol. Terrence copied my action after getting himself to his feet. He, Melody, and I all shared glances with each other as we all backed away from the edge of the dock, attempting to keep ourselves out of harm's reach. <laughs> but it didn't matter, because by the time we were only a few steps away, the creature broke the surface once again, sending a thin wall of water our way. Surprisingly, it didn't throw itself onto the dock, but rather swim around it, only about eight feet or so away. Now that it was up close... I got a better sense of scale as to just how massive this thing truly was. Although, I didn't want to find out how much more of its body was hidden beneath the murky water. I turned to Melody, who seemed confused as to why the creature hadn't attacked us yet, as it swam and circled the end of the dock like a shark. Was it sizing us up further? We got an answer, when a voice, a booming voice at that, that I could have sworn was only making noise inside my head as suddenly emerged. Was this thing speaking to me telepathically or something? I considered that being the case at first until I saw both Terrence and Melody react to it as well. There are no more vessels for this water. Your fellow humans took the rest and not long ago. If you're trying to escape the blue creature, you're too late. Why would they run? That's not a part of procedure at all. When there's a breach, agents are supposed to stay and fight until there's no one left. Only science and finance division employees get to leave immediately. Melody erupted. As much as I agreed with her, I was just stunned that this thing could talk coherently and intelligently like 16A. How many cryptids could? Not ones that I met anyway. Perhaps it didn't really want to violently tear us apart after all. I was blown away, and even though I was under the assumption that it was speaking to us telepathically, I still couldn't help but respond to it out loud. Are you here to hurt us? I inquired, hesitant to lower my weapon. If I am left unharmed, then no. But should you attack me, I would devour all three of you while thousands of feet within these depths. I held back the question that we all wanted to ask for a moment. I just wasn't sure how good it would sound to be recruiting a massive, unpredictable creature that I just met to help us kill one of the most dangerous cryptids to ever walk both this earth and ours. Can you help us? I paused for a moment. With killing the blue one. I know we look like the other humans you may have seen, but we've come from far away and with him alive. We won't be able to get back home. He won't let us. I cannot leave the water if it is your desire to kill him. He will have to be brought here. The slug responded just before diving back underneath the surface. The resulting displacement of the water causing a small wave to crash up against the side of the dock. Terrence, Melody, and I all share an uncomfortable silence and glance around at each other. I knew what they were thinking, but I was the one in charge and I was the one who needed to make sure that I stepped up. 16A could be harmed. After all, we made him bleed. He was fast, powerful, and smart, but not invincible. I reached out to Melody, giving her a look that I was in no mood to argue about what I was preparing to propose. I need the both of you to stay here. I'm going to go back and bait him. Are you kidding me? Terrence immediately erupted, gripping his gun noticeably tighter. He'll kill you in an instant. I flashed my eagle, giving a confident yet sarcastic smirk. If you encounter him, you'll have one chance at a headshot. If you miss or just wound him, he'll tear you apart, Melody argued. You can't go luring him over here alone. Thanks for the confidence boost, I clapped back, already beginning to head down the dock back towards the building. We don't have time for a council meeting. This decision is final. No, Terrence shouted after me. You have no chance. I didn't even look back before saying, being the one in charge has its pros and cons. I was well aware that there was a fine line between bravery and stupidity, 
and I had certainly crossed it. But regardless, I had a job to do and we couldn't stay here much longer. Because if we did, we'd be stuck here forever and left to fend for ourselves. But I ignored any further pleas from Terence and Melody to stay behind with them. Once I made it within a reasonable distance of the building, I peered into one of the windows. Seeing that 16A was already lurking behind one of them, staring me down with those eerie light bulb eyes as I stopped right in my tracks. He was smart. A lot smarter than most would give him credit for and for that very reason, I needed to use my head. Like Melody said, if he charged me and I didn't land a solid headshot, I'd be as good as dead. There was no way that I would outrun or outfight him in any universe. He had physical strength that would put a silverback gorilla to shame. And even that's a comical understatement. I know that we were too far away for him to even have heard our conversation with the giant sea slug, so he couldn't have possibly known about our little scheme. But by the look on his face through the glass, I could tell that he knew that I was playing at something. As soon as I lifted my weapon and pointed it at the window, he darted upwards along the wall, next to it on all fours and retreated into the darkness. He was waiting for me to come to him. I took a deep breath, gripped my eagle and continued on, now feeling death practically exhaling down my neck. I got to the door, aiming my gun as I slowly peered around the corners and looked up at the ceiling. I saw nothing at first, but it brought me no form of comfort. I scanned every wall, every surface that I could, but he was far too skilled at keeping himself hidden. My adrenaline rush only increased further as I heard his voice coming from somewhere above, despite my inability to spot him. You've come to kill me, how pathetic. For decades, I'm nothing but a vessel for your slaughter. A killing machine, as you all called me. And yet, simultaneously, I was nothing to you. After all your ridicule and countless attempts to make me feel small and weak. Now... Now you cower in fear when I finally know just how strong I am. You all wanted a monster. He paused, just before a loud thud erupted through the building, followed by the sight of him landing on the floor around 15 feet in front of me. And now you have one. He was now in a bipedal stance, towering above me with his monstrous 8 foot height. His skin was a slightly lighter blue than the 16A from our universe but his claws looked just as long and just as deadly. Speaking of which, they had a fresh coating of blood on them, blood that I was certain belonged to Ward. So, you kill, slaughter, and tear us all apart, and what now? When do you stop this march of death and destruction? 16A took a few steps forward, only stopping when I aimed my eagle's barrel right at his forehead and rotated my pointer finger over to the side of the barrel not daring to put it on the trigger in front of him. I wanted to take a shot and hopefully put him down right then and there, but he would be expecting it, and with his agility and speed, he was just at a far enough distance to where he'd be able to probably dodge it, and then I'd be toast. So we continued, this little game of cat and mouse. I slowly backed away inch by inch as I attempted to keep him distracted with passionate conversation. I didn't want him to get the idea that I was intentionally trying to lead him away, but rather that I was attempting to escape out of fear for my life, which I'm sure he also had suspicions about. <laughs> I find your attempts at chastising me for causing chaos hypocritical. You, the other agents, and Dr. John. From the moment of my inception to now, you've shown me nothing but hatred of violence and cruelty. Only Dr. West ever dared to show me compassion and you all killed her for it, he growled, now raising a claw and spreading his hand, allowing the exposed parts of his fingernails to gleam in the dim light. At this point, I had backed myself past the door frame at a few feet inside. 16A once again moved forward and my hands began to shake. If I truly was going to take a shot, it was either now or never. I let out a breath. Disguising it as me gathering my thoughts, I gripped the handle and I fired. The 16A had already started moving before I even finished pulling the trigger. 
he dropped to all fours and pounced over to me to close the distance. And in an instant, stood to his feet and grabbed the gun from my hands with his left claw and crushed it like a marshmallow, just before grabbing me by the throat with his right claw and raising me into the air like I was nothing more than a child's plaything. A shame. I considered even sparing you, but you are just like the rest of them. He said as I desperately gasped for a breath while he crushed my throat. Truth be told, I don't even think he had even begun consciously applying any pressure. The feeling of his claws just mere millimeters away from my jugular was enough to make sure that I didn't panic and get my own throat slit. But just before I was about to certainly meet the creator himself, a series of loud bangs rang out. Just before his 16A roared in pain, and tossed me over to the side like a mere box of cardboard. I slammed into an outside wall of the building, and I was sure that I heard one of my ribs crack on impact. As I groaned, gripped my side and turned my gaze over to the dock, 16A dropped to all fours and began sprinting his way right towards Terrence and Melody. I got up, running after them in a pained and limping manner. Of course, it was futile. There's no way that I would catch up to 16A, but I had to do something. I couldn't stay down, even if staying down meant that I didn't have to endure agony. He was hit a couple of times in what looked to be his lower body, slowing him down only a bit, but even still he moved at a speed that would eclipse a cheetah. I could feel Melody and Terrence's terror as he closed the hundreds and hundreds of feet of distance in mere seconds. He managed to evade most of the shots, but even in his slightly injured state, he kept on. The guy really could take a lot of punishment. Melody had run out of ammo on her rifle after falling to land any successful headshots, but she had no time at all to reload. Instead, she retrieved her deagle and began to aim it just as 16A was only a few dozen feet away. But it didn't matter. Terrence ran forward attempting to shield Melody from the blue beast and fire off a shot with his own eagle. But even with how huge he was, he looked like a toddler in comparison to 16A, who quickly leapt up to a bipedal stance and backhanded Terrence with his left claw, sending the big guy flying nearly 20 feet off the dock and crashing back into the murky water with a violent splash. The giant slug appeared to not be coming to help us, should have known better after all than to trust a cryptid. Melody fires off two successful shots in the 16A's lower chest after he had maneuvered, causing him to roar and then lunge forward and snatch the gun from her before she could even react. He then turns and throws it at what looked to be a dang near mile away. The look he gave her after was a nothing but deep-seated rage. I continue limping forward, my awkward run doing nothing to help the feeling that no matter what I did, I wouldn't be able to change the inevitable outcome of this horrible situation. Melody runs and attempts to jump off the dock and dive into the water, but instead was caught mid-air by 16A, who grabbed her by the back and proceeded to throw her several feet backwards onto the dock. She slid across the wood on her back, howling in pain as she reached down into her utility belt and grabbed an unidentified object that I couldn't make out at first. 16A dropped down and pounced over towards her before raising a claw, preparing to quite literally slice her apart like mincemeat. But when she raised the object up, only then did I realize what it actually was. A grenade, and one that she had already pulled the pin off of. 16A reacted like a frightened child, opting to stand, lean down and quickly grab her leg with a claw before her, slinging her dozens of feet away off the dock and into the water. But I could see that just before a 16A had let go, she had purposely dropped it onto the dock. It was clear that little stunt was intended to save her life, rather than thinking it would have actually worked to kill him. 16A turned his head after watching Melody's body collide into the water, only to see the grenade was now right at his feet. He backed up as quickly as possible, only getting about two large steps away before it exploded sending him flying back into the water as well, albeit still alive but not more wounded than previously. A chunk of the midsection of the dock had been blown apart, sending boards and logs into the water below. After several more seconds of my limped run, I finally made it to the edge of the dock, 
huffing and puffing to catch my breath while I held my side. Terrence had already broken the surface, seeing me holding my side and doing his best to get himself out of the water. Did you see Melody down there? I asked, genuinely wondering if she had sustained damage from such a harsh throw. Yeah, he coughed, grabbing the top of the dock as he hoisted himself up. Melody emerged from the depths not too long after and began quickly swimming her way over with a bit of struggle. I saw a trail of blood following her in the water, indicating that 16A had cut her with his claws while in the midst of roughly grabbing and tossing her off the dock. Hurry, I snarled. Terrence bent down to help her out, seeing as I was in no condition to be straining myself past this point. After she was on the dock, I looked just where the source of the bleeding was, which had turned out to be her calf. The slash itself didn't appear very deep or serious, but I nonetheless pulled a cloth out from my belt and wrapped it around her wound, tightening it to stop the bleeding. You're a heck of a fighter. Can you still walk? I inquired, helping her stand up. She noticed me holding my side, allowing both me, her, and Terrence to all briefly brag that we had encountered one of the most dangerous beings ever and lived to tell the tale. It stings, but yeah, I can manage. We need to hurry and get back to the gateway. We have less than seven minutes. I, Terrence, and Melody, with a bit of a lamb, all begin to quickly make our way toward the beginning of the dock, only to be stopped dead in our tracks by 16A, who had emerged from the water and leapt up onto the dock. It was clear that he had taken more initial damage from the blast than I thought. Starting from his right shoulder all the way next to his right eye, he had horribly charred skin, indicating burns from the heat of the grenade explosion, as well as what looked to be several cuts and gashes from a shrapnel being blasted into him, which were on top of his several gunshot wounds. Now, while I think the damage he sustained would have killed any regular man several times over, he was obviously not a regular nor a man. He didn't waste any time with any monologues or speeches. Instead, he dropped down on all fours yet again and prepared to lunge over the hole in the dock right next to us. And in that moment, I truly thought that was the end, with no significant weapons left to defend ourselves, and we'd be toast. But just after he had left and was in midair, something rather shocking transpired. The giant sea slug bursted up from below like a bullet train, crashing and destroying even more of the dock as he did so while grabbing 16A right in his jaws, which were now revealed to have several rows of black teeth all shaped like jagged pizza cutters. 16A roared and cried out in pain as the sea slug thrashed around with him in his mouth. 16A clawed and lacerated the sea slug's face enough to draw blood, but it was admittedly pointless. Large amounts of 16A's blood began to pour down the sides of the sea slug's mouth, and it had been clear who was truly going to leave this encounter alive. The sea slug then retracts back down into the water below, bringing 16A with him, as we all watched like flabbergasted children. I leaned over her. Seeing the water below fill with a midnight blue color, a telltale sign that 16A was no more. Or at least, it wouldn't be soon enough. I guess you can trust cryptids after all. I uttered in pure shock but also grand relief. But we didn't have time to celebrate. We had to make it back. First, by maneuvering our way around the now colossal hole in the dock with falling back into the water and then booking it once we made it back out of the island itself. We all ran as fast as we could one last time, this time with Melody taking the rear due to her leg, but she was still able to move reasonably well. I turned back multiple times as we covered distance in order to make sure that she was still with us. Terrence was at the front while I still kept a hand on my side. Two minutes, she bellowed, only making our hearts pump faster as we approached the building. Terrence waved us both in as we made it into the main doorway, immediately doing a quick turn to the right and running down the hall to the science wing. We passed a few agent bodies that we hadn't seen the first time, still more blood and weapons scattered about in the hallway, but there was nothing that we could do for them now. It wasn't long before we found the room with the gateway, 
It sat at the end of the hall, the symbol that we were almost out of this nightmare of an operation. We made it to the doorway of the room and turned the corner, feeling that same magnetic pull towards the opposite wall of the entrance. The gateway was becoming unstable. Papers, pens, and all sorts of objects going flying across the expanse of the room towards it. Come on, go, 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 I ordered, stepping to the side. I stayed behind, allowing both Terrence and Melody to go first, watching as they disappeared into the black void. I took one look back, cementing the fact that I was more than happy to leave this place of a universe behind. What happened here was nothing that we could change, but something told me it was a warning. A warning that things could have turned out much differently had certain events transpired with only subtle changes. I turned, jumping into the gateway and landing back into our reality with Jennifer, Dr. Garth, Terrence, and Melody all waiting for me, as well as a couple of extra scientists. Close it, close it now. Jennifer ordered Garth and the other lab coats who frantically typed away at a panel on the far side of the room and hit several buttons in a purposeful pattern. I leaned over the desk, where Jennifer was seated at, exhaling heavily as she looked at me with concern. Where's Agent Ward? Was all that she could muster to ask. But the look that I gave her in response said it all then as she soon made the connection. A look of disappointment in her eyes. I knew that she wanted me to tell her more, to describe everything we experienced and saw. But for the moment, I could only say four simple words. Never open it again.